Okay, I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. Um, thank you all for uh, coming out to the Rotman talk. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Emily Thomas from Durham University. We've had a lovely visit with Emily so far, and I'm really looking forward to today's uh, talk because Blazing World is one of my uh, fun uh, books to read. It's a wild, crazy uh, travel anthropology science fiction book from the 17th century. So I'm pleased to welcome Emily. She'll be talking about travel writing as thought experiments, science, bacon, and Margaret Cavendish's Blazing World. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right, so hello, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm grateful to Ben and Eric and Chris for organizing this. So what we are going to talk about today is indeed uh, travel and early modern philosophy. Before I get started, I wanted to say a little bit about where this fits into my work as a whole. Those of you who were around yesterday know that I normally work on very serious stuff. <laughs> so, I say theories about space and time and the history of philosophy. That is not what I'm going to be talking about today. Recently, I've been writing a brand new book, um, and it's about uh, theories of travel. Right, so, it's a popular book, <laughs> um, as you can see. <laughs> right, so it's a bit lighter than the sort of material that I usually deal with. Um, but I think it might be fun to talk about. So, the kinds of questions that I'm asking are issues like, uh, what is humanity's relationship uh, to the wilderness? So this is the kind of thing that uh, Henry Theroux talks about in Walden. Uh, you know, how should people live? How should we relate to nature? Um, and of course, Theroux handles it by wandering out into nature um, and sort of building himself a hut, which makes everyone very happy. Other sorts of questions I've been asking are things like what maps are. Um, and I discovered from my own knowledge that maps are not straightforward representations of the world. In fact, they're really complex philosophical objects. Some people think that they are objects of power. Other people think that they are processes rather than substances. Other sorts of questions are around gender. So there's been some really interesting <laughs> work of late on the philosophy of gendered concepts. And this is the idea that a concept can be gendered. You might think that philosophy is one example of a gendered concept. When you turn to something like travel, you can ask whether travel is gendered. Um, and the short answer is yes. <laughs> right, this is a photograph of Scott's last expedition to the Antarctic. Although it might not be obvious, I think that there are various ways that travel plays a role in early modern philosophy. And I wanted to run through some of those ways before we get to the meat of the talk. So one way that philosophy and travel interacted during the 17th and 18th century is found in the work of Francis Bacon. So this is not Bacon, but this is somebody who has arguably been influenced by Bacon. Bacon argued, he was one of the first people to do so, that if we want to understand the world, we can't just sit in our armchairs and reason about it. We have to go out into the world and we've got to bring back stuff. So we've got to find plants and animals and fossils and take them back with us. And, and this new philosophy of science led to enormous quantities of travel and, and it developed a new breed of sort of traveling scientists. I see people like Captain Cook and Charles Darwin. We also have John Locke using travel to argue for his theory that the mind is a blank slate. So people reasoned that if all human beings were born with the same innate ideas, then different human cultures around the world would all share similar attitudes to certain practices. And Locke 
draws on the travel literature of his time to say that is absolutely not the case. Right, so he points to things like <coughs> cannibalism um, or exposing infants, infanticide, to argue that clearly human beings don't share the same attitude to practices all across the world. And that's one reason to think that we are all born with minds like blank slates. One last example before we get on to Cavendish um, comes from someone close to my heart, which is the 17th century philosopher, Henry Moore. He argued that space and time are divine attributes. Right, so space is literally God's presence in the world and time is literally God's eternity. And this divinizing of infinite space and time <coughs> led to changes in the way that people thought about spaces that look infinite. So stuff like seascapes and mountainscapes. Suddenly you have this rash of poetry arguing that mountains are divine, they're like cathedrals to God. It, um, and this was a real shift in attitudes. In the past, people thought that mountains were really ugly, pockmarked is what one person called them. Right, so again, we have a shift in philosophy producing a way, a change in the way people thought about travel because suddenly tourism to the open seas and to mountains really increased. Okay. What we're going to be looking at is more of the material on Bacon. So we're going to be looking at the way that travel is interacting with the philosophy of science in the 17th century. Um, and specifically, we'll be looking at Margaret Cavendish's uh, fiction, The Blazing World. When I first read The Blazing World, it is, as Ben says, a really strange book and I wanted to know why she wrote it. I'm going to be arguing that Blazing World is making a number of different points. So you have these on your handouts. One is that she's making claims about the worth of Baconian science, Francis Bacon's <coughs> science. Another is that she's making claims about what a utopia could look like. And, and finally, I think she's playing with the line between fiction and reality. The plan for this talk is as follows. So you have it on your handouts, but I'll give you in brief regardless. In section two, I'm going to look at the notion that travel writing can be a thought experiment in general. Section three, I'm going to talk a bit more about Francis Bacon on science. In section four, we're going to look at Cavendish's attack on Baconian philosophy of science. And then in section five, I'm going to look at this fiction, non-fiction divide. Okay, so, section two. Travel has a really long and entangled history uh, with fiction. With fiction in particular, but with writing in general. And, and lots of travel books blur the line between fiction and non-fiction. So I think you can sort of arrange... Oh, yes, this is just writing. <laughs> I have to amuse myself when I put these together. There's more to come. <laughs> so, so, um, if you take an example, it, um, <laughs> this is taken from uh, John Mandeville's uh, travel literature book from the 14th century and um, lots of books like this are using fictional devices even though they present themselves as being works of non-fiction so just to give you an example um, in Mandeville's travels we have someone who's describing how he arrives to Jerusalem it's all quite practical he describes the method of his travel and, and then when he arrives he finds the rib of a giant that's 40 foot long and this fictional fact is just slid into what seems to be a non-fictional narrative and you find these kinds of devices all over the place so if you're reading more recent travel writers like Will Bryson or John Gimlet they're constantly using devices of fiction to, to sort of add colour to their non-fiction narratives. 
Now, because this was happening so often in the early modern period, people like Francis Bacon, who were trying to obtain scientific data from travel logs, began asking for people to please write more clearly and more truthfully about their travels. Um, and just to make this point, I think that we can arrange travel writing on a kind of spectrum from non-fiction to fiction. So we have something like Thomas More's Utopia or Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. They are works of fiction, but they are in the shape of a travel log. You might pick them up and think that they were works of non-fiction. At the other end of the scale, we have someone like Darwin's Voyages. This is a work of non-fiction, but he's still using some fictional devices like metaphor or hyperbole to kind of make his points uh, yeah, to make his points. Some works of fiction act as thought experiments. So we normally think of thought ex we normally think of experiments, as you all know, as of things that happen in labs. You know, the Large Hadron Particle Collider, or people using pipettes. Thought experiments take place in our heads, and the nice thing about fiction is that you can craft really long, detailed, substantial thought experiments. They can be ways of running like, really involved scenarios in our heads. There's a really long history of travel books, fiction and non-fiction, that also act as thought experiments. So just to give you an example, I, Cicero in the first century BCE wrote his dream of Scipio, um, and this recounts a Roman general who has a dream in which he is taken out of his body and he floats up through the planet's atmosphere up to the stars. Um, he looks down at the planet Earth from his vantage point high on the heavens and he's struck by how small the planet Earth is. Um, and he has all these concerns about, you know, uh, what the Roman Empire will or won't do next. But when he sees the Earth from this perspective, he, he sees how little the Roman Empire is in the scale of things. Um, and that leads to a shift in the way that he thinks about it. In effect, the dream of Scipio is a thought experiment. He's suggesting that when we imagine sending ourselves up into space to see how little the world is, it's gonna affect a change in the way we think about the world. To give you another example, this one is probably better known. It, um, oh no, right, this is just more stars, because <laughs> stars are good. Next example is Thomas More's Utopia. So this is written in the 16th century, um, and Thomas More asks us to imagine a young man who's sailing off the coast of Peru, and he finds an island called Utopia. Um, and on this island, the inhabitants live in very different ways to the way that they live back in More's 16th century England. So, for example, like priests can marry, uh, divorce is permissible, um, women can be priests, uh, and euthanasia can be practised. Uh, and these were things that would have been really shocking notions in 16th century England, but by setting this thought experiment on a distant island, it allows more to work through what the consequences might be of having a society that accepted these kinds of practices. All right, so again, this is very much a thought experiment. He's asking us to reflect on what would happen if. Moore's utopia was so well known that the word utopia has of course been come to apply to many, many new <coughs> kinds of stories that followed. And although we sometimes talk about utopias, 
I think that today we are generally much more concerned with dysutopias. So these are societies that have gone horribly wrong <laughs> in a wide variety of different ways. Um, and I even have a picture here of one such society. Okay, so this is travel writing and thought experiments in general. Moving on to section three, I want to say a bit more about Francis Bacon and his views on science. So, at the turn of the 16th, 17th century, natural philosophers are really beginning to emphasise the importance of observation and experiment, and Francis Bacon is absolutely foremost among them. From really early on in his work, Bacon attempts to produce a philosophy of science. He's attempting to detail the principles on which science should run. Okay, and then I, I did warn you, so I have in my notes here, when you type Bacon experimentalism into Google, you get this. <laughs> But, so, so, what Bacon wants humans to do is write a grand natural history of the world. He wants everything. So he wants us to catalogue all the beetles in the world, all the types of cloud, all the types of plants, every other living creature. And it's an absolutely gigantic project that Bacon is sort of sitting in his study and he's just envisaging what it would be like if humans really managed to bring together this mass of information and really had a universal natural history. Right? So he has gigantic ambitions about what humans should be aiming at. Bacon is well aware of how enormous this project is. He knows it's never going to be completed in his lifetime. And of course, we are far, far from completing it now. So if you think just about something like, this is the Natural History Museum in London. It's gigantic. It contains information on all kinds of things. But this is just a tiny fraction of the amount of information that Bacon would want us to collect about the universe as a whole. So in his early work, The Great Instauration, Bacon details the categories that scientists should be looking into. Um, and just to give you an idea, it includes stuff like the history of the heavenly bodies, the history of lightnings, air as a whole, history of hail, snow, frost, hoarfrost. Like, he wants absolutely everything. <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah, his writing is pleasing, I think. The idea that you want a history of flame and things ignited is great. <laughs> okay, now. Travel is absolutely central to this enterprise. Bacon thinks the only way we're going to come close to collecting the amount of information that we need is if people go off into the world and bring it back to us. He thinks that books are absolutely central to this endeavour. Um, again, that we need testimonies of what far-flung travellers have found or discovered. Bacon really places a lot on the importance of travel. And just to show you how much, so this is the frontispiece <coughs> of his book, The Great Instauration, and, and there's a lot going on in this picture. So what we have is a ship going out between the pillars of Hercules, which is supposed to represent the limits of the known world. So he thinks that ships should go even further and we know what's there. And, and then right in the distance, you can see another ship to the left, and it's coming back. And, and that ship is riding lower in the waves to indicate just how much treasure and um, in scientific knowledge the ship is heavenly laden with as it comes back to us. Okay, so, and just so you know, this quote in Latin at the very bottom, and the translation is that many shall go to and fro and knowledge will increase. So Bacon is explicit that travel is to be linked with the success of the new science. Now, 
Bacon was also a religious man, and so he ties his beliefs about travel and science very tightly into his theological understanding of the world. Like most 17th century Europeans, he firmly believed in two theses from the Bible. The first is that humans have fallen from grace, but they will eventually be restored to it. One focus of biblical prophecies is the city of Jerusalem. There are prophecies that suggest that when the end of the world arrives, Jerusalem will be rebuilt in some way. What's more, um, the very title of Bacon's book, The Great Instauration, instauration is a really archaic word, but back in the 17th century, it was associated precisely with this rebuilding of Jerusalem. Right, so although the meaning is not obvious to us, if you were reading it in the early modern period, you would, you would take Bacon to, you would identify the double meaning that Bacon has in this title. On the one hand, in, there it will be a great inspiration, a great renewal of the sciences, but on the other hand, there will be a great renewal of humanity, and because eventually science will lead to the end of days in a good way. Once you see some of the religious symbols in Bacon's work, the others really, really begin to jump out at you. I see that at frontispiece, for example, the, prophecy, the, the line about how many will go to and fro and knowledge will increase is actually taken from a biblical prophecy. It's taken from Daniel. So Bacon is telling us that the fall of humanity from grace can be restored by doing science and by doing science in a travelly way. Bacon talks about some of the recent discoveries that have been made through travel, and, and he argues that we should be using them to push ourselves forward even further. So he writes in one passage, uh, it would disgrace us now that the wide limits of the material globe, the lands and seas have been breached and explored, if the limits of the intellectual globe should be set by the narrow discoveries of the ancients. Nor are these two enterprises, the opening up of the earth and the opening up of the new sciences, linked and yoked together in any trivial way. Distant voyages and travels have brought to light many things in nature, which may throw fresh light on human philosophy and science. So for Bacon, not only will travel improve science, it will take us all the way into the apocalypse in a good way. <laughs> um, small thing to add, right, so Bacon also wrote a utopia. It's called The New Atlantis. It's an unfinished work, but it was intended as a companion piece to his other book, Silva Silvarum, um, which, uh, is can, which also discusses his philosophy of science with the emphasis on travel. Uh, so the, the novel and the philosophy of science book were supposed to be paired together. Uh, and in The New Atlantis, it, uh, a group of travellers also sail to an island, uh, it's called Ben Salem, and what they discover there is that the islanders have set up a scientific research centre in the middle that's run by a person called Solomon, again, all terribly apocryphal, and, and everyone living on the island is really happy. <laughs> right, so this is a utopia. He's arguing that if only, you know, 17th century Europeans would embrace science in the way that the inhabitants of this place do, we would also be really happy and one step closer to paradise. Okay, right, so this is the background and now we get into Cavendish. I don't know how many of you have heard of Cavendish. I'm assuming some of you, but maybe not all. Um, so this is Margaret Cavendish. Uh, she is a woman philosopher writing in the 17th century. Uh, she was 
uh, born in England, but because there were lots of political troubles going on at the time, she travelled extensively around the continent. And um, she was supported in her philosophical endeavours by her husband, William Cavendish, which was a rare attitude back in the 17th century. And she's one of the very few women philosophers in the early to mid 17th century who published philosophy under her own name while she was alive. Uh, most women philosophers didn't. It, uh, they're either writing philosophy in letters or their works were published after their death. It, um, and Cavendish paid a price for that. It, I, lots of people thought she was mad. She became um, a real object of celebrity in some time in a ridicule way. Uh, on the other hand, she got to do lots of great things. So as a woman, she got to uh, visit the Royal Society, for example. Um, she met many famous philosophers of the day, including Mersenne and Hobbes. Um, and she was really uh, sort of at the heart of... She was really at the heart, I think, of the developments that were going on in mid-17th century European philosophy. In addition to writing many straightforward philosophy books, she also wrote plays, and she also wrote what we're going to be focusing on today, um, a philosophical novel. So it's called Blazing World. Uh, here's the original frontispiece, the description of a new world called the Blazing World. I'll give you a very brief introduction to the plot. So, the star of this novel is a young lady. She is unnamed. In the opening pages, uh, she's wandering along the shores of her country. She's very beautiful and pure, and she's kidnapped by a merchant. He wants to carry her off to his own land. The heavens, the sort of celestial entities, object to this, and, and so they uh, raise a tempest that forces the merchant uh, to move his boat towards the icy seas of the North Pole. Uh, the merchant and his ship's crew all freeze to death around the North Pole, uh, but the lady is protected by the power of the heavens, um, and so she remains alive. The ship moves closer and closer into the North Pole, and when she arrives there, something even more peculiar happens. So Cavendish tells us that they were not only driven to the very end or point of the pole of that world, but even to another pole of another world, which joined close to it, so that the cold, having a double strength at the conjunction of these two poles, was insupportable. And at last, the boat, still passing on, was forced into another world. This second world, this new world, is illuminated by two suns, um, and that's why she calls it a blazing world, because it has two suns, <laughs> so it is literally blazing. Just very briefly, if you're wondering why the North Pole, um, I think the answer lies in this search for the Northwest Passage. Right, so early modern intellectuals were kind of obsessed with it, that whether there is whether there is a Northwest Passage, if so, where it might be. Um, there were many ships trying to find it during this era, um, and many of the ships uh, ended in tragedy, their voyages. So Cavendish is almost certainly sort of drawing on that tradition. Um, there's also a scholar who's made a really nice suggestion as to why Cavendish calls the world the blazing world. And it is about the way that the North Pole is represented on maps. So you can see in maps of this period, if you look at the very top of the globe, it, um, you have what seems to be sort of radiant lines coming out of the star. It, um, and uh, Lina Cotton has suggested that that might be another sense in which the blazing world is a blazing world. It, it's literally passing through the lines of a star at the top of the map. Okay, going back to the novel, the lady and her ship arrives in this new world um, and the temperature begins to warm up. 
Uh, the bodies of the merchant and his crew begin to putrefy and they begin to smell and she very sensibly pushes all the bodies overboard. <laughs> so then it's left with just her on this ship sailing these alien seas. A group of bear men begin walking towards her across the ice um, and the bear men offer her their help. There are various adventures along the way but before too long, um, this young lady is installed as the empress of the blazing world. And it's from this point on that the philosophical bits of the novel begin to emerge. When we are reading accounts of Baconian science, I think it is very easy to assume that it was unchallenged. It seems so obvious to us now that things like experimentalism are good, and, and Francis Bacon is often just hailed as, you know, the father of science. And so there's a tendency to think that Bacon's programme went completely unopposed. But that's not the case. It, Cavendish is offering attacks on elements of Baconian science. And that is largely what Blazing Wild is about. And I'll explain how. Before I get into that, I'm going to say very quickly that Cavendish does not oppose science in general and she doesn't oppose Francis Bacon's science in general. So in this text, for example, she makes remarks that sound as though she's quite a Baconian about science. So, for example, she is praising um, people who have gone out and learned about animal husbandry and vegetable farming by dint of trial and experiment. She thinks that that's a good way to learn how to produce crops and how to rear animals, um, by learning through experience, trying different things in the fields. And, and she really praises explicitly um, experience by practice mm. and judgment <coughs> by observations <coughs> That, um, you know, and people who do that, and they also have learning and conceptions of natural philosophy, so as to learn and search into the causes and effects of nature's works. So this all sounds quite Baconian, you know, experimentation, observation. The next passage suggests that she is not entirely a Baconian. So, having praised people who are going out and learning about farming through experiments, she then adds, so shall we know how to increase our breed of animals and our store of vegetables and to find out the minerals for our use. So what Cavendish is saying here is that these scientific developments are to be praised because they've been useful to us. They've allowed us to improve the number of crops we can grow, allow us to improve the health of our animals. In this early text, the notion that science should be useful is not yet contrasted with Bacon's own view, but that contrast begins to come out the more she writes. So three years after publishing this text, 1662, Cavendish then writes her observations upon experimental philosophy. And this is a 400 page doorstop of a book, and it is an attack on various different scientific practices. She takes various different scientific activities, goes through them one by one, and raises concerns for them. The one that I'm going to focus on is her attacks on microcrophes... I can never say this word. Microcrophesy? I'm still not saying it right. Can anyone say it correctly? Microscopy. Microscopy? Good. <gasps> Words that you only write and never say out loud? Horrible. <laughs> okay, good. She's attacking the practice of studying the natural world using microscopes. Now, the science around microscopes was fairly new in Cavendish's time and people were just starting to get really excited about it. So in 1665, Robert Hooke had published um, his Micrographia, 
um, and it became a kind of signature text for the Royal Society, which was just about becoming the UK's first society of scientists. Um, and in micrographia, Hook is really doing a great job of popularising the use of microscopes. And, and a lot of what he's saying is, look how cool they are. Um, and he does that in a variety of ways, but one of the most powerful ways is by use of images. So just to give you a couple of examples, um, he gives us the image, this is a needle on the very top, and, and he's showing us how, you know, we think that a needle is, is small and sharp, right? but in fact, the edges of a needle are scratched and pitted, and, and that there are many, this down here is the edge of a razor, Again, lots and lots of scratches. It's not smooth or sharp at all when you look at it under a microscope. And, and these images were really powerful to people who had never seen things portrayed at the microscopic level before. And Hooke uses them, these images, to argue that by using microscopes, humans will fully discover the composition structure and in emotions of bodies. So he's not just showing us pictures under a microscope, he's saying that they will lead us to the truth about what bodies really are. Just to give you another example, uh, here's a full stop under the microscope. It, um, that it's certainly not a neat circle, it's this kind of crazy hodgepodge of lines. Although lots and lots of people found Hooke's micrographia really wonderful, Cavendish was not one of them. She was really doubtful about the value of microscopes. So in her observations, she attacks it on various different levels. And she starts by arguing against Robert Hooke that this new science is not able to discover the interior natural motions of any part or creature of nature. She's arguing rightly that we don't get to see the inner parts, we're just seeing the outer parts made bigger. And what's more, she thinks that we don't even see those outer parts accurately. So to give you an example, she writes, um, through science, uh, we make cylinders, concave and convex glasses and the like, which represent the figure of an object in no part exactly or truly, but very deformed and misshapen. So also like a mirror that is flawed, cracked or broke, or cut into the figure of lozenges, triangles, squares or the like, will present numerous pictures of one object. For example, a louse, by the help of a magnifying glass, appears like a lobster. Here we go. Right, so this is one of the images from Robert Hooke. And Cavendish is arguing it appears like a lobster, but that appearance is deceptive because, she writes, that the, ma the microscope enlarges and magnifies different parts of it and makes them rounder and bigger than they actually are. So she thinks that she thinks that the process of putting something under a microscope it actually uh, leads the shape of its external parts to be misrepresented, that, um, that we're not straightforwardly enlarging something, that the microscope is introducing errors into what we're seeing. Now, some of her objections are really prosaic. So... Back in the 17th century, microscopes weren't very good. <laughs> and they were often cracked, right? And we all know what it's like. We see a mirror with a crack in it. And of course, the reflection is distorted. And back in the 17th century, you know, glass makers were often not producing perfect glasses. And, and that is going to lead to distortions. But not all of her objections are that prosaic. She's also pointing to the fact that when we are looking at an image down a microscope, it's not as though we are looking at the, when we look at a thing down a microscope, we're not looking at the thing itself. We're looking at the image of a thing as it's projected. And the fact that we're looking 
at a reflection of the thing can introduce errors. Um, and these are worries that, of course, some philosophers of science um, have raised later about microscopes. Cavendish was well aware of the sorts of problems that could emerge because she practiced extensively with microscopes herself. So she and her husband actually owned a collection of microscopes and she was so fond of one that her husband nicknamed it my lady's magnifying glass. And so she was really aware of the practical issues with microscopes and also that they could distort whatever you're putting under them. Now, what's interesting is that Hooke himself acknowledges this. So in the preface to the Micrographia, it, he writes that it can be very difficult to discover the true shapes of microscopic bodies because the shapes change depending on what lights they're shone under or what angles you look at them. And, and despite that, he suggests in other passages that looking at objects under microscopes is just as straightforward as looking at something with the naked eye. And it's that move that Cavendish is attacking. She's saying, look, there are clearly problems here, and that means that it is not as straightforward as looking at something with the naked eye. For this reason, Cavendish doesn't think that microscopes will lead us to fully understand the inner or outer parts of things. She doesn't think that microscopes can lead us to truth about the world. She describes microscopes as a superficial wonder because she thinks, sure, it looks really cool, but it's not actually helping us do anything. Okay. Cavendish doesn't just argue for this thesis in her philosophy book, Observations. She's also arguing for this in Blazing World. So in exactly the same way that Bacon paired his Silver Silvarum with the New Atlantis, Cavendish pairs her observations upon experimental philosophy with Blazing World. She's doing this consciously and deliberately, echoing Bacon. So just as we have these two, Cavendish is saying, we also have uh, these two. They're even printed in the same book, Observations to which is added the description of the blazing world. We're now, okay, going back to the blazing world. And um, so the Empress, having become Empress and meeting her inhabitants, she sets them to work in various ways. So she founds various societies among them. And this is a cartoon explanation of the different societies that she founds. One example is the bear men. And she asks the bear men to be her experimental natural philosophers. And she proceeds to ask them various questions like, what is the nature of thunder and lightning? What are the motes of the sun? What stars are there? What is the air? And of course, these questions are very much like the questions that Bacon is asking in his earlier work. Although her bear men attempt to answer the Empress's questions about the natural world, they don't answer them to her satisfaction. So, for example, um, the bird men astronomers uh, cannot agree on the nature of thunder and lightning, and they fall into arguments about it. The empress turns to the bear men, and she asks them to observe the world through their telescopes. But the bear men also fall into arguments about the nature of the stuff they're observing through their telescopes. Some of them want to say that the sun moves, some of them want to say that the sun doesn't move. Um, and again, the Empress is disappointed with their findings. The bear men then say, oh, well, if our telescopes don't work, maybe we should try you out with our microscopes. So they bring out these microscopes to show the empress. That, um, one of the things they show the empress is an enlarged louse. So very explicit reference to Hook here. 
Um, unfortunately, this doesn't go to plan either, because when the Empress sees this giant louse, she faints, <laughs> falls into a swoon. When she wakes up, she quizzes these experimental philosophers on what good these microscopes can do. So she's saying to them, you're showing me this enlarged picture of a louse, but can that stop lice biting people? Um, can it prevent the spread of lice throughout the human population? It have, does it tell us anything about lice that might be useful to humans at all? And of course, the bearmen have to say no to this. The Empress is disappointed and she tells the bear men that, um, that you should busy yourselves with experiments that might be beneficial to the public. So again, Cavendish is saying, this is just a superficial wonder. There's no use to the stuff that you are, there's no useful information that you are providing us here with. Again, though, it becomes clear that Cavendish would be open to these new scientific practices if they could provide data that was beneficial to humans. And she's pretty explicit about it. Right, so it, in the observations, Cavendish writes that it could experimental philosophers find out more beneficial arts than our forefathers have done, either for the better increase of vegetables and brute animals to nourish our bodies, it would not only be worth their labour, but of as much praise as could be given to them. So I think if the bear men knew what we know today about the utility of microscopes, you know, the fact that it's that led to advances in medicine, we understand how many more different things work in ways that are beneficial to humans, if the bear men could have made that argument, I think Cavendish would have been swayed um, and allowed them to keep the microscopes uh, with her blessing. Uh, but as it is, there's no obvious point to it. Um, and so she wants to say, that just doesn't fit with my vision of science that should be pursued for the betterment of mankind. As you would expect, Cavendish also wants to reject Bacon's notion that any of this stuff will lead to the apocalypse in a good way. So at one point, the Empress has a conversation about where paradise might be located, and she's told that she's already in paradise. So again, the blazing world is a utopia story. And by pursuing science in the right way, under the guidance of the Empress, we will create a society, a society that is sort of happy and wholesome. Okay, last section. So, this is gonna get a little bit more metaphysics-y, but it's quite fun and it's quite short. So, I think that Blazing Wild is more than just a fictional travel book. I think that Cavendish is quite cleverly blurring the line between fiction and reality. To explain exactly how, I need to tell you just a tiny bit about her metaphysics in general. So Cavendish is a materialist. She's, she's quite similar to Hobbes. For Cavendish, everything in the created world is material. God is a different matter, but everything around us is material. Now, unlike Hobbes, Cavendish also thinks that all of this material stuff is alive. <laughs> right, so we have like literally living flowers, living stones, living mountains. She's a vitalist. For Cavendish, matter is filled with active life. She's really aware that this view is controversial. The notion that matter can be alive was hugely unusual in the 17th century. Uh, you do find it in a few other thinkers, but it's pretty few and far between. Now, Cavendish believes, though, that one of the big reasons in favour of this view 
is that human beings are part of the natural world. So she thinks that someone like Descartes, who says that the human mind is an immaterial soul, but we have a material body and we move around in this material world, she thinks that Descartes is privileging humans above the rest of nature because we have immaterial souls and the rest of nature doesn't. Cavendish wants to resist that privileging. She wants to say that human beings, minds included, are just as much a part of nature as anything else. So we're all sort of on the same level, if you like, as plants and flowers and mountains. For Cavendish, our world is made of matter that's alive and it's active and it's also continuously moving. I have no idea how to represent this on a slide, so we just have little bits of matter moving around. Cavendish perceives some really big similarities between our universe as a whole and our ideas. So our ideas inside our heads. She thinks that the universe as a whole is a big mass of moving matter and exactly the same is true inside my brain. It's just a mass of moving matter, but it's little. <laughs> the universe is really big. In various places, Cavendish reflects on the similarities between our minds and the universe as a whole and on the power of our minds to build imaginary worlds inside our heads. So we can sit in our armchairs and I can, I don't know, maybe I could build an island in my mind like New Atlantis or Ben Salam or Hogwarts, or whatever it might be. She thinks that human minds have this really sort of unexpected power to build worlds inside our heads. But because for Cavendish, ontologically speaking, our heads are made of the same stuff as the universe, that means that when we build a world inside our head, we are in quite a literal sense building a new universe. Just like our universe is a big mass of moving matter, if you think that ideas and imagination are little masses of moving matter, then that means that when I sit here and I imagine a new world, that really is a world in exactly the same ontological way that our actual world is. For that reason, her husband William Cavendish uh, praises her, um, praises her for writing Blazing World. Uh, and he writes in the preface that Columbus was for navigation famed, found a new world, America it is named. Now this one world was found, it was not made, but your creating fancy thought it fit to make your world of nothing but pure wit. So he wants to say that in a way Cavendish has gone up even further than Columbus. He discovered a world, but she's made one. In this way, and I think Cavendish is very consciously aware of it, um, she is just as much an explorer as Columbus. Yeah, um, and this is, this is the final way that I think Blazing World is working. So on the surface, Blazing World is a science fiction travel book on which a young lady wanders through the North Pole it, um, it, and has various adventures. You go a level deeper, it's an extended thought experiment designed to flag up some of the problems with Francis Bacon's new philosophy of science. And if you go a level deeper still, it's not fiction anymore. It is literally a travel book. Cavendish thinks there is a sense in which we can travel into this blazing world in exactly the same way as we can travel to other bits of this actual world. Okay, and that's it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
is how in our, in our critique of uh, micrographs, um, microscopes, excuse me, uh, she is uh, revealing her actual use of not just uh, microscopes themselves, but all versions of lenses, projection systems, and I think of the distortion that we get from, uh, say, projecting uh, through lenses uh, up on, on screens for artists to write with and things like that. How much of that do you think plays a role in her uh, empirical critique of? It's not just that she's recognizing there's distortions, it's that when we magnify, when we're uh, presenting things in a magic theater, for example, we're seeing them distorted, where we can actually compare the distortions and uh, with the uh, object projected and the uh, the image that results. I'm not sure I know what a magic theater is. Oh, it's a <laughs> it's it's a you have these mirrors and it kind of projects these images through a uh, through like it's like kind of like okay. a like a little version of a pinhole camera. Is how I understand okay. it. Okay. 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 So you can uh, project up onto a screen um, and then you can get uh, sometimes different versions. Yep. Okay. Art okay. and artists will sometimes draw from. Yes, these it, things that as makes well. Sense. Okay, so. I, so she's definitely thinking about lots of different lenses, not just microscopes, for sure. Yeah, so she's very worried about telescopes as well, is another obvious example. And um, I think her objections to all of these things come down to the same cluster of worries. So there's this practical worry that these glasses aren't perfect, and maybe if you had perfect glasses, some of those worries would go away. But then the second cluster of worries is, you're always looking at a copy of the thing, not the thing itself, and then that introduces distortions. I mean, anything that goes from being a 3D thing to a 2D image, you're going to get some distortions. Um, yeah, as artists know well. One of the things about doing it through lenses where you've got an object that's being projected uh, in some way is that you can see the object itself and then you can see the the projection image well you can't for a microscope right the microscope the actual yeah. thing is always invisible uh, to the human eye obscure from you right yeah. and so you can actually have that vantage point where you can see that there is a distortion whereas in microscopes you can't you just kind of guess or predict that there is yeah that's nice so i think that's where yeah. i see the inference coming in on, yeah, on how yeah, she's yeah. presenting yeah. it yeah yeah i think that's true i like that Thanks. Yeah. Um, Jim. Um, you, you made a, uh, what I thought was a really interesting observation about Thomas Moore talking about controversial subjects, but saying they're happening over there. Yeah. And, and, and it made it much easier than saying, let us suppose here we did it. Um, uh, that strikes me as, as, as right and, and really interesting. Um, is there something analogous to that going on here? Did she say anything? that would have been controversial if, if she had said it here. Because arguing about the microscope doesn't strike me as that kind of... Yes, uh, yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't qualify. But were there yeah. other things that were sort of like that? Yeah, I, I mean, the biggest one is the fact it's an empress in charge. <laughs> That, that, that it's an that it's a woman in charge. Oh, oh, that, yeah, oh. that, that she becomes that now. There is a kind of a device for this in the novel. So she actually marries the emperor, and and then in theory he's the one who's really in charge. But in the novel he just wanders off <laughs> and say you do everything, and which would have maybe made that slightly more. Yeah, I see what you mean. Also, I, I suspect in the same vein, the fact that she was kidnapped to start with. Yeah. So she wasn't an aggressive yes, woman. Yeah, of she course. Was, she was she an still chased and honorable. And had to rise to the occasion. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really true. I, there are various, so there's various discussions about uh, making weapons in the book. And, and I don't know what they are, but I'm sure there's going to be some kind of political commentary going on there about the Civil War back in England, and about the way oh. that weapons were used and so on. I would need to know more about the Civil War in order to do that, but I'm, but yeah, sure. yeah, I think there are going to be lots of illusions. <laughs> and th th that said, there aren't there aren't any of the biggies that you find in Thomas More. Um, yeah, in terms of euthanasia and divorce and right. things. Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. No, the, uh, the, the, to the, I mean, this, the, this is in blazing <coughs> world weapons. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cause, so it's not so much of a utopia then. I, I can't remember the discussions of them precisely. But, um, but there's, uh, well, how is it a utopia if it's got weapons? I, 
<laughs> That's a question you could definitely ask. She seems to think it's compatible, if we st it, or at least she's talking about them, it, like the ways that they might be developed. Does anyone else remember the weapons in Blazing World? Any of you who've read it? I, all I remember is talks about like cannonballs and things, which isn't very helpful. But, um, it was actually certainly she's certainly talking about what role they would play. It, yeah, yeah. Oh, but fair, you might well think not a utopia. But then I'm, I'm sure in these other utopias that Thomas More and Francis Bacon, they wouldn't have find it inconsistent to have weapons either. No, my other, my first finger raise, this okay. is, okay, just what, I will have a hand later, but the first finger raise was about uh, your point about the microscope, and it, unlike the drawings where you can see the thing and check it. That's also true with the telescope for distant things. That yeah. Was just no, that's true. Yeah, agreed. Mm. Yeah. Uh, there was someone in the back corner, MJ? Yeah. I have a question kind of about colonialism. Okay. And I think I was very struck by your photograph of what looks like a modern day Pitt Rivers. Okay. In his little museum there where he's oh, yeah, yeah. the skulls and all the things they brought back. And I was thinking that that's kind of where Bacon's dismissal of armchair speculation of the, of the world will take us. Go out, he gives that quotation from yeah, the, yeah. the Francis piece. Go out and bring stuff yeah, back. Yeah. But there is a process of taking away from yeah. the peoples that you are visiting yeah. to bring things in. It, it, yeah. It's not an accident that it's at the formation of the English nope. Empire that yeah. this whole way of thinking is coming about. And so that I was really struck where you ended your talk, and I'm on your handout, where you said that um, Cameron's counter exploration of the travels through a new world is just as real as our own. That's a really, I think, a controversial way okay. of thinking. It's almost it's almost impossible to believe. It seems like yeah. you know, people did treat her as being not mentally well yeah. in, the, in her own time. And I'm just wondering, do you think that there was a kind of uh, colonialist politics to, or ramifications to the way she was conceptualizing science and travel? Um, or is her idea of we can do as much in our minds as we can do going out and coming back, is that governed purely by the opportunities that she was allowed as a woman? Okay, that's nice. Okay, so. Yeah, absolutely. This this age of exploration, you know, sometimes it's called the age of discovery and you're only discovering things from one perspective, <laughs> from the perspective of people who are already living in these places. Yeah, it's a very different thing. And um, it's definitely tied together with the formation of empire building. Um, and I think I mean, Bacon is well aware of that, and that's one of the reasons that his scientific project was so successful. I, because, you know, he, he's not motivating people to send ships off to bring back fossils, but he's motivating them by saying, uh, or they are motivated by thoughts of new trade routes, for example. That, um, even if it's not colonialization, there's money there that they are looking to make. And, and so Bacon kind of just gets lucky that he has this new view of science around the time that, that people are sailing around the world anyway, and he gets to piggyback on that. In the practices, so, okay, so after Bacon's death, we have the Royal Society formed by sort of leading intellectuals of, of the day in England. And what we find there is explicitly they're posting notices to like to ship sailors and merchants and diplomats, people who would be off in these countries anyway. And they're asking, could you please look out for like X, Y, and Z? And, and as a result, I mean, some of what's sent back to them is really funny because these people aren't scientists and they're just sending back random collections of feathers or you know, really strange reports of stuff they find on the ground. Uh, so definitely, this travel is tied into this history of empire building, for sure. And um, not all of it is. I, so, so you know, there, there are some people who seem to just be going out into the world and they just want to collect samples of fish. <laughs> and, and then that seems to be more innocent than the other stuff that's going on. As for the stuff about Cavendish in particular, she. 
she has quite a lot of views on travel and so a big phenomenon back then was the Grand Tour. You know, you send off your, yeah, your sort of 16 to 19 year old youths around Europe, you want you wander around. And, and although in theory, this is supposed to improve your education. And in fact, it seems like an excuse for debauchery. If you look at their diaries that are coming back, you know, it's all about the drinking and the women and the gambling. And, and Cavendish is really critical of this Grand Tour practice. And, and she thinks it just leads to violence. <laughs> But on the other hand, when people are coming back with these more sort of scientific purposes in mind, she seems really uh, positive about them as long as it's leading to benefits in the way people are living. You're right, though. The thing with Blazing World, even if it is a real travel story, you're not going to be getting that new sort of scientific data back. That's just not going to be happening. And, and then the notion that one of her motivations for thinking about it that way is that it allows her to travel more, I think is true. And yeah, as a 17th century noblewoman, it would have been very difficult to do any more than the kind of Western European trips that she did. But she wanted to, I think that comes across. She would have liked to see more than she did. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Corey? Um, yeah, uh, I'm just wondering uh, to what extent do you think that Cavendish's criticism of uh, Bacon is fair? Right, because I mean, Bacon isn't, uh, he isn't just pursuing science for science's sake. Ultimately, yeah. Bacon pursues this because he wants, he thinks that the knowledge of nature will allow us to make nature fly with more ends. It's the grand Baconian equation of knowledge and power. Uh, and so the, it, it seems like that her criticism, at least as far as it's directed at Bacon specifically, is more Good, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, excellent. So there's a really good quote. So even though Cavendish is aiming her critique at Bacon, you might well ask, but really is Bacon saying anything? He'd passed away by this point. But, um, so really the people she's aiming it at are the Royal Society, I think. But, um, and she seems to just assume that Bacon and the Royal Society they're going to share all the same principles in this regard. And I think there's a really good case to be made that they aren't, that they share many of them, but not all. I, so, for example, in some of his writings, Bacon actually seems quite uncomfortable with the idea of pictures in science at all, and yet the Royal Society is embracing these new sort of pictorial arts. And, and Cavendish is not making that distinction. To be fair to her, the Royal Society didn't want to make that distinction either, just because you know Bacon's such a huge man of stature that it that it helps the Royal Society to be identified with with his legacy as far as possible, and um, so I think, yeah, yeah, okay, good. So I think <laughs> a lot of what she has to say against Bacon is not necessarily aimed at Bacon; it's really aimed at the Royal Society. I think that's nice. Yeah, also. As a note, I know that, yeah, officially Bacon wants to build this thing to like improve mankind, but it sounds, but he's, and that's what I want to say, but it's not obvious that he's thinking in the same way of, of practical uses as she is. Like, you know, so learning about the different airs or the fishes or the distant heavens, it doesn't seem like he's suggesting we look at them with sort of tangible results in mind. I think he did just want to know how stuff worked, but in a general way. Yeah. Uh, Benjamin? Yeah, so kind of following up to Corey's question, um, but with respect to uh, Cavendish's critique of Hook, do you think there's anywhere to find in Cavendish's work uh, her commitment to some sort of uh, the view that ideas are the immediate objects of perception or anything like that? And if so, um, do you, to what extent do you think her criticism of Hook um, is fair? Ah, because you're thinking that we're perceiving ideas rather That's than right. perceiving yeah. the images of the mind. Yeah, I mean, because with her language, I mean, it's, yeah. it seems clear that you know, she wants to say that we're not perceiving the objects as they really are. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's okay, that's nice. I'm, I'm not aware that she levels any kind of indirect realism sure. uh, attack on Hook. That is really nice. <laughs> I like that. Um, 
it, that's, it certainly seems like that's something you could do, right? And yeah, yeah, but I'm not aware that she does. Okay. It, yeah, I mean, I'm not aware that anyone does, but, but yeah, but it'd be a great point to make, I think. Yeah, cheers. Hey, uh, Lauren? Uh, it just can't escape the impression that this is a very unflattering description that you present of, of someone who is an ultimately deeply sensitive intellectual. She wrote the Doug Ford of early modern Europe. Uh, saying to me, uh, I'm the Empress, show me, what are you looking at that small stuff for? What are you looking at that remote stuff for with your microscopes and your telescopes? What, what possible good could come of these investigations into this very small and very really remote stuff that, that cannot plausibly have any effect on, 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 on actual life? Uh, that's the impression I'm getting. Uh, uh, I'm not going to give you funding for that. Uh, because uh, microscopy, what possible good could learning about be very small things? Well, there's something else happening with this guy. I'm going to play and pause it for a bit. This is throwing sparks and igniting fire from a touch of ice. This is a big charge behind it. And there are people coming up to him and saying, What are you guys doing fooling around with this electricity? What are what possible good could come from mucking around with that stuff? And it's like she's doing the same thing. Okay. It's, it's kind of a very, a, a very disturbing attitude to have towards scientific research. Okay. Just, just to clarify. Or have we got entirely the wrong picture? If, if you don't know who Doug Ford is, he's the Ontario Premier. It's a new conservative Ontario he, premier. Oh, I did not hear, no, you don't. So you might, okay, yeah, you good. Donald Trump of yeah, you can substitute Donald Trump in as a doppelganger. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, good. Okay, all right, let me answer this. So, she's definitely not anti-intellectual. But, um, I mean, she, you know, she's engaging with this technology herself. But, um, she's trying to understand it. Uh, she's writing you know, books of philosophy, lots of which uh, has a real sort of natural philosophy bent. And she's not saying this stuff has no possible use. I think what she is really objecting to is, is Robert Hooke saying, uh, here's all this new microscope stuff. It, um, it will tell us the true natures of things. I think that is the link that she's really attacking, that she just doesn't think that the link is there, that she just doesn't think this is going to tell us what things are really like. Um, and I don't think that's anti-intellectual. I think that's her, she, she's trying to preach. She thinks that Hook is just going too far. He's just making claims that are too big for the pool of evidence that he has. And of course, Hook has, Cavendish has her own really detailed theory about how matter works um, and and so with hook providing what might be taken to be a kind of rival view of matter it's in her interest to undercut it and to say that just doesn't get you to where you think it does and i think i think that's true i think hume hume i think hook <laughs> does make claims that are too big for the pool of evidence that he has yeah, yeah, so I don't think that's anti-intellectual. I think it's quite a specific objection that she has to what's been going on. And, and it's not like she thinks they should stop doing it. It's just that she's saying, this doesn't lead to these grand things that you say it does. She's not making the bearish research funding. <laughs> she lets them keep their telescopes and their microscopes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, she's definitely a rationalist. I don't think there's any doubt about that. You know, she's um, just like Descartes and so on. She wants to work things out from first principles, but she's, but she's not hostile to, to natural philosophy at all. But, um, I think she just resents these big claims. Uh, Bill? This, was a, this is just the, another, from before. Where did she travel when she was in Europe and did she talk to 
what we would regard as the early modern scientific people, there were some really neat Sorry. things going on. She, she had dinner with Descartes once. Okay. But you said um, she... Digby, Yeah, so she was in Paris. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, so, yeah, France, So Lebanon. there were all those experiments going on. I mean, yeah, yeah, some, yeah. Some people were already doing some pendulum experiments, not... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she's she's definitely well aware of this stuff. Yeah, and, and so, like, when she visited the Royal Society, uh, they made up various experiments uh, for her. They, like, showed her how different things dissolved in certain kinds of acid, uh, the way that some things would burn um, and others weren't. Um, I think she was really, like, she was really interested in the science of her period. Yeah. Great. We have time for another question. Uh, Bill. Okay. Go ahead. This is a bad This is a bad Okay. I, I was, all, all, with the stuff about the practical stuff, and, and your answer to Lauren made it seem that she would be less ready to object than I feared. But what would she think of cosmology today? To, to, okay. Today, in, you think you're going to take it? Up? Yeah, cosmology. What we're trying to, trying to find out the large scale structure of the universe. Yeah, I think she's not going to be keen. <laughs> not unless it, um, it can be shown that this is going to have some, some benefit for all of us. Yeah, I think she's just going to think, oh, that's a gigantic use of money towards something that doesn't help people in a practical way. And I think a lot of people have this attitude to science now, right? Funding yeah. bodies are a really obvious yeah. answer. But, you know, it's a hell of a lot easier to get funding to develop a new medical drug than it is to develop yeah. a new particle collider. And, and of course, there are counter arguments that, that we make now that, that we don't know where new research is going to lead. You know, there might be all kinds of uh, beneficial stuff that we discover on the side. And, and that yeah. argument isn't made by anyone in that period, as far as I'm aware. I think okay. that's a really that's a, new thing. That was my next part. Yeah. Oh, yeah, OK, okay. good. It, yeah. Well, perhaps you know of some exceptions. But no. So, uh, Jim, do you, next? Do, do you know anything about her politics? I mean, this attitude that is, seems to be clearly coming out is so un-aristocratic. It's very middle class. And I mean, she's it, a royalist. She just doesn't sound like an aristocrat who would be happy to squander a great deal of money on utterly useful things for aesthetic reasons and so useless. Yeah. I, I, I mean, no, I don't know enough about her political obligations. I mean, she's a royalist. Well, what side was she on in the, in the, in the English Civil War? Oh, 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 the royalist side. It, that's why oh. she was exiled. Well, she is a real aristocrat. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, she, absolutely. She was a lady yeah. in waiting to the queen. She was. Uh, it's a bizarre, <laughs> this, this practical concerns sound just completely out of character for her social class. Ah, that's not oh, you don't think so? Well, no, I'm not sure I do. It, um, do you know what? I just don't know enough about the politics of the time. But it doesn't sound implausible to me that people want to take pragmatic attitudes, even when they're full aristocrats. Yeah, yeah. Okay, in okay. Bit, okay, no, interesting. Yeah. I may have a very simple minded view of, of the issue. <laughs> but if you have lots of money, you just want to fund art, and and why not? That's much more common. Okay, all right, yeah, yeah. fair. Okay. So, I'm, I'm very interested in the part of the story you told about, um, about her giving uh, souls, I guess, yeah. to plants and matter and everything. Um, did that get her in a lot of trouble? Theologically, perhaps, with you know, well, people, she's not. people have souls. And, and second, I mean, I have my DNA tested at, you know, with uh, ancestry and so on, and I'm like 50% banana, right? We share the DNA with all living things. So it seems like we're coming around to this view. <laughs> I like that. Okay, okay. So she she wouldn't want to say that plants have souls. She would simply say that a plant is a material thing that is alive, and that's it. Yeah, so that so no immaterial souls on her view. Although you could talk about it sort of metaphorically in that way. Um, 
Yeah, and I think the idea that human beings are part of nature, definitely, that's becoming more and more popular and widespread. Definitely, yeah. I mean, you know, all this concern with you know, climate change and our place in nature, I think lots of that reflects the idea that we are part of the natural world. Yeah. As for getting her in trouble back in the day, uh, Hobbes was already in quite a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, and I think she was tarred with the same brush. But Hobbes is worse than Cavendish from the 17th century perspective, because Hobbes wants to say that even God is material. And, and lots of people think he's really an atheist. And, and then that's a big problem. But whereas Cavendish allows that God is immaterial, so she's going to escape a lot of the critique that's leveled at Hobbes is materialism. And then maybe she just looks better, <laughs> by contrast. Uh, Corey, you had... Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm more familiar with the, uh, so in the 18th century, and I'm, I'm familiar with some of the travel writing there, especially okay. in connection with the German natural scientists that went along the second Cook expedition, for instance. But some of the kind of, one of the interesting things that you find there are, are, are able to glean from those, those dynamics are uh, attitudes on the part of the Oh, sorry, towards to indigenous knowledge. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and it made, and it's so. I mean, you, that's perhaps more of a kind of a perfect thing to look at in kind of the non-fictional part of the spectrum as you present it. But uh, I wonder if there's a kind of attitude towards indigenous knowledge that might be derived from ways in the world. I mean, this is apparently a society of kind of indigenous Baconians. Yeah. Um, is her attitude towards them in any way kind of revealing or interesting with respect to? This kind of issue. I mean, is, is her attitude toward them always in a sense of, uh, you know, I am the queen in this kind of, you know, patronizing or uh, judgmental way, or is there a kind of uptake as well from her reaction to these two things? That yeah. Kind of the systems of knowledge she talks about? That's a really nice question. I, so there's certainly things that they teach her and she learns from. And yeah, but the. The impression is that they're not as bright as her, actually, which is quite an uncomfortable thing to say <laughs> in this context. Um, you know, in that she's installed as empress, you certainly get the impression that she's considered to be more sensible. Um, and that's why she's making these decisions, you know, for the good of all of them. But, um, but nonetheless, that, yeah, that, that she's in a position to make these decisions and that they aren't. Um, yeah, and in that context, that's a difficult thought to have, yeah. I think. I mean, she's certainly well-meaning towards them, but that's not enough. <laughs> yeah, that's really nice. I like that. It, it would be nice to hear a little bit more about the emperor, actually, to know what their relationship was. But we hear so little, it's very difficult to tell. Yeah, thank you. Well, on that note, let's uh, thank our speaker, please.